Greetings fellow conquerors and welcome to another video about Rights of Man where I'm going to be talking about the free features that the patch added. So uh, I made another video right before this where I talked about you know what do the paid features add and what do I think of the actual DLC pricing. And this video is probably going to be uh, kind of lengthy. I'm going to talk about the free features, AI changes, and uh, maybe bug fixes. So uh, we'll see where we get on that. This video may be long and if you don't feel like watching the whole thing you uh, might try skipping around to find the you know the part uh, that you're talking you know that you want to you know hear about because I'm going to try to explain some of these um, you know the ones that I understand anyway. But anyway, uh, without further ado, let's get on with actually reading these uh, features. So first, uh, we get uh, created a new technology system using institutions with no more westernization or directly differing technology groups. So this is kind of the big change of the entire patch, like the biggest like you know, crazy, game-changing change that Paradox made. And this is really cool because overall what it does is it attempts to make it so that um, even, you know, nations that aren't European actually have a way to compete now without being at a severe uh, point deficit the entire game. Um, which is awesome. I think it's really cool. I think it's going to change the playability of pretty much every single nation in the game. Um, depending on how well you do as a nation. Um, and of course, it has its own way of working that uh, we're all going to have to discover. And, it, and we may find out that it's still the, you know, the case that the West is still just on top of everything. Um, it's also important to note that unit tech, like units are still tied to tech, and so at certain points of the game, certain techs are going to have better units uh, than the others. And uh, you'll want to check on the uh, wiki for that one to see uh, when the units are. But anyway... Uh, next we get new culture acceptance mechanics, where you can decide which cultures you want accepted in your nation, and which should be the primary culture. So this is nice if you're a nation that's conquered land that, you know, isn't exactly your culture, and you want that to be your primary culture instead of whatever you had before. It, it makes a lot of sense, um, though most of the time if you were in that situation, the big culture would get accepted anyway. All the same, it's very nice to, to have control over this so that you can directly affect your uh, economics, essentially. Um, as far as unrest goes and things of that nature. Uh, next we get the added the brain dead player AI setting to completely disable AI takeover if a player disconnects. That's good for multiplayer. I would imagine it'd be very frustrating if you uh, get disconnected for five seconds from a game only to find out the AI has completely ruined your country in that time. Uh, which is, you know, pretty nice. Uh, next we get minimap displays player friendly and enemy units. This is good if you're a nation like Russia and you have units all over the world at different places at different times. So that's pretty cool. Uh, next we get uh, added the Embrace Cheat to embrace all institutions in a province or for a specific institution. Um, which is, you know, it's good to have cheats to, you know, test things and, you know, things of that nature. Uh, added the Exhaust Console Command uh, to alter war exhaustion. Um, that's pretty neat. I don't know if it works for... I, I guess you would have to set a target nation first, but uh, that could be pretty hilarious if you like to use cheats and console commands. Uh, just give everybody 20... Give the entire world 20 war exhaustion and see what happens. The, the Just the utter chaos that would ensue. Um, next we have the government view. Now shows more detailed information about the different cultures and the acceptance of them in your state cores. All right, we need to think about this. So the government view now shows more detailed information about the different cultures and acceptance of them. Okay, so now it's just a UI update telling you more about different cultures and acceptance. Because before it was a little, a uh, little hidden and obscure in the way that the UI actually worked on that. Uh, when in a succession war, the attacker can now demand cancel subject on the country in question as part of the war goal. Let's see. Oh, okay. So if I if I remember correctly. Let, let, let me just read this again. When in a succession war, the attacker can now demand cancel subject on the country in question as part of the war goal. So this is like when you're fighting for a personal union. Um, the attacker... Oh, okay, I see, I see what this is saying. So normally, I guess you wouldn't have been able to uh, cancel subject on a uh, on the defender in the succession war. Um which was kind of a problem. I could see that being a problem. <laughs> if you wanted to do something other than take land or money, like, you know, you just kind of have a bunch of wasted war score. Um, added, p added power spend console command that prints global power spend statistics to the game log, and that can optionally take a country tag as an argument. Interesting. So that... 
is basically saying that uh, you can you can look at uh, power spending statistics in the game log, which is pretty interesting. Uh, added reset power spend console command to reset all power spend stats to zero since it tracks spending so far. Added build daytime or build date time to version console command. Um, added. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, like added a build date time. Um, Oh, to the version console command. So, I guess it's tied to that console command. Still not exactly sure what it does. Maybe it just tells you when something was built. Um, as the leader of a trade league, you can now create a trading city from one of your provinces. Requires Mare Nostrum. This new nation will have the trading city republic government and will automatically join your trade league. That's pretty cool. Um, just Paradox trying to make playing tall and playing you know merchant republics more like playing a merchant republic instead of just encouraging blobbing. Which is something they've really been about since, like, the Cossacks, almost. Or even, a uh, Common Sense. Um, added dialogue for sending crash reports. That's nice, I guess. Uh, host now sees a checkbox on player disconnect notification that lets him specify whether the AI will be active or not for the disconnected country. Okay, so, so that's kind of like a... Yeah, so, so the host can set a checkbox for a disconnect notification. Okay, sure. Um, or, yeah, the host now sees a checkbox. Anyway... Um, economy console command uh, now displays the sum of all expenses in each category since the beginning of time or until reset economy is executed uh, embrace console command now lists the optional help argument and help okay sure alright game balance this is the part I really wanted to get to um, first we have theocracies especially the papal state have an increased alliance acceptance penalty towards different religions Turkle papal diplomacy has hit an all time low <laughs> That's, uh, first of all, that's pretty hilarious, and second of all, um, this makes a lot of sense, like, if you're a super religious state, you obviously wouldn't want to, you know, ally with people who aren't your religion, that's just, it's kind of, you know, common sense, I guess. Um, there is now a scaled penalty to liberty desire, up to 25% at max mercantilism. Um, so I guess having high mercantilism is going to hurt you somehow. Um, vassals fighting each other, uh, such as in Japan, now always accept enforced peace requests of overlord, but all vassals accept the defending peace... Uh, or yeah, defending peace target get plus ten liberty desire. So yeah, if you're in Japan and you want to, if you're playing as Japan and want to stop your daimyos from fighting for whatever reason, uh, you can do this. But then it'll raise their liberty desire. Um, treasure fleets give the same inflation per gold as gold mines. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, trade companies are now open to all technology groups. It's another you know another really cool change. It uh. Makes a lot of sense since, you know, nobody's technically, you know, nobody's Western anymore. Um, and you would, if you're a colonizer, say you're Indian, and you manage to colonize the, uh, you know, the Cape of uh, Africa, <laughs> um, you could make a trade company there, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, natives reforming now get all institutions of the target they reform from, so... That's pretty cool. Um, if you reform from, you know, a good nation and kind of gives Native Americans and of all, of all, you know, types, just a better chance. Um, plutocracy is now, yeah, plutocracy is now 10% faster in institution spread in your country instead of 5% cheaper tech. Uh, this makes sense since all tech costs are virtually the same across the board based on, since tech groups no longer exist, and uh, it's, it's good, I would say, it, from, what I've, from what I understand about institutions. Um, the sci scientific revolution now also gives 10% embracement costs as well, uh, which I believe is from innovation or innovative ideas. Um, so yeah, that's that that reduces the cost of actually because you have to pay ducats to get institutions, so um, that'll impact that for sure. Uh, added lots of logical places where province and country status impacts institution spread. Okay, so this is just saying. Um, Let's see, lots of logical places where province and country status impacts institution spread. Okay, so it's saying that like there are various circumstances and conditions that are going to infect or affect the, uh, you know, the spread of institutions. Basically, uh, next we get institutions penalty, which slowly ticks up by one percent per year after discovery. So after I assume the f the second either you or um, somebody in the world discovers an institution for the first time. Um, everyone else gets 1% uh, tech costs up to like um, 20, yeah, I think it's 20% per institution unless it's feudalism. 
um, which in the which case it's uh, 50%. But that's the first institution, and most nations already have it, so um, not really a big deal. But yeah, I think I think the max per institution is up to 20%. Uh, spy network bonuses will now apply to the target subjects. Uh, that's nice. It lets your uh, you know subjects fabricate claims better, I suppose. Modifiers for very easy difficulty should now never be worse for those than or worse than those for easy difficulty. That's kind of hilarious. Um, you can now you can no longer move capital to a continent that has less than a third of your total provinces unless your capital is the last province you own on its continent. So that's just stopping you from you know moving your capital. Pla random places that wouldn't make sense. <clears throat> subjects now have land and naval access to other subjects of the same overlord. That makes sense. I'm surprised that wasn't already in the game, but hey, we're all vassals under the same person. It makes sense. Eastern European starting development reduced. Okay, this is really interesting, and I like this change a lot because for the longest time, the Polish Commonwealth has kind of been like the scourge of the East. And for the entirety of, like, the past couple patches, Muscovy has almost never been able to get off the ground just from um, Poland being virtually invincible, from what I understand. Although I did manage to beat them as a uh, Jerusalem, funnily enough, in a recent game I did. Um, anyway. <clears throat> so, this is going to be a big change that's going to make the East a lot less scary. It's also going to make all of the starts in the Balkans a lot more difficult because beating the Ottomans is going to become more difficult than ever. Um, you're ba basically having Poland-Lithuania may not be enough anymore. Um, d you know, other circumstances notwithstanding. But yeah, <clears throat> pretty big change. Excited to see how that changes the uh, actual flow and pace of the game and uh, how Eastern Europe might survive. I, I hope Novgorod didn't get a nerf because... Um, I actually found Novgorod to be like a pretty difficult nation to play as, as it was, and if they lost development, that might make things um, worse. But uh, it, might, it might also make an alliance with Poland easier since they're since they're somewhat weaker, and they might have the same rival. So we'll see what happens. Uh, look, I, I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, next we get a uh, Bariatian or Bariation. I'm not sure. Uh, starting development reduced and redistributed to Manchuria and Mongolia. So. I guess they were just kind of redistributed. <laughs> um, Lithuania now only has plus three tolerance to heretics instead of plus four. Kind of a small nerf, um, but it does it does make their country more likely to explode in, into confetti, uh, depending on things. Uh, lucky nations are now down to, to eight. Sorry to Poland, Brandenburg, and Sweden. And it's important to note alongside this that uh, Muscovy has stayed a lucky nation. So what they're doing with this is they really want you know, Muscovy to branch out more with this patch. Um, but yeah, Poland is, again, nerfing Poland because Poland is was kind of like the most OP nation in the game, uh, basically, um, even like stronger than the Ottomans for the most part. Um, Brandenburg, I didn't realize Brandenburg was a lucky nation, but it makes a lot of sense, um, which is hilarious because they still didn't really do all that well in most of my games, but... Um, I digress. And uh, Sweden as well, I didn't realize was a lucky nation. Um, but them getting nerfed uh, might make things a little more difficult for them. But I think lucky nation bonuses only apply to AI, so if you're playing a Sweden, it doesn't really matter. Uh, next we get sanctioned commercial monopoly. Now costs 50 papal influence instead of 100. So now you can get one point in mercantilism uh, for 50 papal influence instead of 100. Which is pretty good. It lets you do a lot of trading and kind of really encourages if you want to get a lot of mercantilism to just stay Catholic because the other religions don't really have a way of doing that. Um, of course, bigger nations get more cardinals, so uh, if you're blobbing, that's kind of where that comes you know, comes in handy more. Uh, next we get Defender of the Faith. Now gives you plus 10 opinion with all people of that religion. That just makes sense. Um, it helps you get alliances, things of that nature. Um, one province minor natives can now migrate over one sea zone as well. That's really cool, actually, um, and opens up possibilities, I suppose. Um, knights lost their tolerance for heretics. Kind of sucks because none of the land they can take near them is their religion, including their starting island, um, which is probably going to have rebels pop at the start of the game, which is awful. Um, but they can instead do slave raids, uh, similar to the... Uh, you know, Berber nations, which is pretty cool. It might net them a good amount of money. Um, it might be a long-term buff. It might not. I personally find the tolerance for heretics better, but, you know, that's up to your own personal taste, I suppose. 
Institution penalties can all tick up to 50%. Okay, so I was wrong about the uh, 20% institution penalties. Um, so the longer you wait, the longer, the more your tech is going to cost, which is... Um, so hopefully institutions don't take too long to actually embrace, um, because otherwise this could seriously be like an issue for like a lot of nations, um, just getting a lot of really ridiculously high tech costs. Though having 50 years to... Um, you know, I integrate them and accept them uh, should be enough, I would think. Uh, overhauled Lucky Nation bonuses. I wish we had specifics on this, but um, I don't know if they were nerfed or buffed. You know, you'll have to look for yourself. Um, Native Reformation now removes primitive flag. Um, that makes sense. So if you, like, reform, you get, like, a modern flag. That's, that, that's kind of cool, actually. Um, superiority War Goal. Now requires 10% war score from battles instead of 80% battles of battles won. That is actually a huge change because so many superiority wars, um, you just could not get that like war score ticking in either case, and the war would just drag on for ages until basically a white piece was signed. So this is going to make those wars a lot more decisive, um, I would say. Uh, score is now modified by negative 50%, negative 25%, zero, plus 25%, and plus 50% depending on the difficulty selected. Well, that's good. <laughs> if, sc if score wasn't impacted before, why would you ever play on anything other than easy? Uh, maybe it was before, but maybe not as much. Uh, increasing development in a province now increases institution spread of the earliest possible. Um, that's kind of cool, actually, and encourages actually spending a point to develop every once in a while. Um, and certainly is an uh, indirect buff to uh, economic ideas for sure, um, because that idea group actually like, you know, affects in, or affects development costs. So, um, how kind of sucks if you don't have common sense, because otherwise you can't really develop things. Um, but yeah, it, it increases the rate. I don't know by how much. I don't know if it's still like still like not worth it to develop your provinces most of the time if you're not playing tall specifically. But uh, I guess we'll see. Increasing institution spread by increasing development scale. Oh, here we go. This is the actual amount of like, you know, scale that we get. Uh, scales on the amount of development in the province with tw uh, development twenty giving five and development two giving point five. Okay, so I don't know if it gives uh, goes any higher than that, but um, I don't know how you even get a province development of two. Um, that just doesn't make any sense. Like you have to have at least one of each category, which is three, but. Paradox math. Um, yeah, so basically, it's just saying the uh, yeah increasing institution spread uh, by increasing development scales on the amount of development in the province. So institutions spread faster in big provinces, essentially. So there's some impetus to develop at least some of your provinces so that the institutions spread more quickly, um, which just makes sense, I suppose. Although if you already have a bunch of provinces that are big anyway by essentially blobbing, then it may not be an issue anyway. Um, there is now an increase in efficiency of embargoes for a nation scaled by its mercantilism up to f plus 50%. So I guess the more mercantilism a nation has, um, the better their embargoes will be, is what I understand from that, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, ships now engage in a priority order from heavy, galley, light to transport, up to a maximum of the engagement width, for which heavies count as three rather than one. So ships are when they're fighting each other are now going to try to kill heavies first, then galleys, then light ships, then transports. This means that you can't really just move into a stack, snipe away some of the smaller ships, and then retreat, which is pretty good because um, it was really annoying before when you would fight for like two days and lose like all your transports, um, which was stupid. Uh, next, we have uh, attrition loss for a given level of attrition is now proportional to the strength of the unit, whereas previously it was proportional to the maximum possible strength of the unit, and thus invariant. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I think, if I'm reading this correctly. So, so it's saying, let me just, let's, let's see. So, attrition loss for a given level of attrition is now proportional to the strength of the unit. Okay, so, what it's saying is, I think it's trying to say that, like, for each individual unit, that unit is going to take attrition uh, based on a percentage equal to their actual unit strength. So a unit with 500 men left in it is going to take less attrition than a unit with 1,000 men in it instead of just going off the entire stack, um, which makes sense. Uh, relieving a siege now makes the sieging force the attacker in, in combat. Um, let's see. So... so I think what this is basically saying 
Um, yeah, okay, so this, so what this is saying is, if you attack a siege, and it's in the mountains, for example, uh, no longer do you take a minus two for trying to stop that siege in the mountains, instead the enemy will take a minus two penalty. Um, which is really huge and encourages building forts and actually like defensible places like hills and highlands and things of that nature. I just that just that makes a lot of sense and it's actually a really nice change that I think is going to change how combat works and it specifically makes forts a lot better. Even though forts are probably still way too expensive to have more than a couple um, at a time. All right, if you have a port, you now get at least five sailors per month. So. Um, sailors are kind of were kind of a dumb idea for me in the first place, but at least this makes it so that nations um, that only have like one port can actually get sailors uh, to build boats. Um, but yeah, minor change overall, I would say. Uh, reworked foreign spy detection and counter espionage. Counter espionage has less impact on discovery, but both uh, but both now impact the spy network buildup of the target in your nation. Um, so, so what it's saying is, uh, yeah, so now what foreign spy detection does is it, it, it slows down the network buildup more so than actually stopping, like, it from happening, basically. Um, which makes a lot more sense, because if you had a certain level of, uh, counter-espionage, you could kind of just stop people from fabricating claims on you, and it was kind of very troll, um, we get a new, we get two new parliament issues, um, if you're into parliament, um, you can now increase manpower in a province instead of tax, and uh, an another one now increases production in a province instead of tax. So that's pretty neat. It's kind of a small change. Um, large colonial nations now give you uh, plus five land force limit each. This is cool and makes sense and gives more impetus to colonize, uh, which I like because I don't particularly like colonizing, but I know that like that's a kind of a big deal because you spend so much money on it. When you change religion as a monastic order, devotion is now decreased to the resulting religious unity if it is lower than current devotion. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. So it's 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 saying that like, if you change your religion that most of your country has it doesn't have, then you're not going to have a lot of devotion, and so your like income is going to be like drastically affected. All right, next we get uh, reduced cost of docks and dry docks, uh, which is nice because it helps encourage people to actually build those buildings. Uh, patriarch authority no longer reduces tax income. This is huge because for the longest time, uh, there was almost no reason to increase your patriarchal authority because it impacted your income, and that was just pointless when most of the events, most of the events that reduced patriarchal authority, it was like, why would I ever want patriarchal authority but when I can just take religious ideas instead, for example. Um, so that's a really good change. I think that's really going to make Orthodox a much better religion overall. Uh, breaking vassalage with a vassal that has over 50% in liberty desire no longer gives a relation penalty. That just makes sense. Obviously, if you free a country, they shouldn't be, like, pissed at you. Um, Prussian ambitions discipline has been nerfed from 7.5% to 5%. Well, sorry, Prussia, you're, you get the same discipline as everyone else, I guess. Except Japan, who still gets 10% because they're crazy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Prussia now gets the Prussian monarchy when forming, which is pretty cool, and I think that actually affects, like, all of their combat stats, the, uh, the new government, so, um, look out for that, basically. Uh, air chance modifier no longer affects the life expectancy of your air. I did not know that it did that in the first place, and, um, I wonder how that's gonna make the game play, basically. Um, all countries should now have access to at least one skill to advisor at start. Um, that's nice, I guess, but, I mean, if you're a small country, it doesn't really help you anyway. It's not like you're going to be able to pay for it. Um, the Holy Roman Empire can no longer form Persia. So I guess if you were playing as the Holy Roman Empire and you conquered all the provinces in Persia, you could form Persia, which is hilarious just to think about, but... Um, slight changes in how aggressive expansion is calculated. Again, we don't know if that's good or bad, if that's going to make coalitions more likely or less likely, but I guess we'll find out when we're playing. Just be on the lookout for that. Uh, reduced unrest and Republican tradition impact from sowing discontent spy action. Um, so, yeah, this is really nice because uh, sowing discontent was really ridiculous, actually, and really annoying in the late game, um, just from the sheer amount of damage it could do to your country. Um, so that's nice to see that it's, like, not going to be as annoying. Um, though it is kind of an indirect nerf to espionage ideas. 
Uh, increased liberty desire from tariffs up to 50% liberty desire at 100% tariffs. So more liberty desire from tariffs means you're not going to make as much money from your um, colonial nations. Fair enough. Um, well, without getting more liberty desire anyway. A uh, penalty for not occupying forts in an area will no longer apply if the enemy does not control any forts in the area. Um, so, so let's let's see what this is trying to say. So, the the penalty for not occupying a fort in an area will no longer apply if the enemy does not control any forts in the area. I assume this means in peace deals, is is what I'm thinking that that means. Um, or maybe it's like a military. I'm, I'm actually not sure what this means. It, I, I think it refers to peace deals and how the AI won't give you a province if you haven't sieged down a fort. But, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what that's trying to say because it's not very specific. Um, decisions to become merchant republics now require you to have 20 or fewer provinces and states. This makes sense because Paradox limited the number of provinces. Um, but, yeah, kind of kind of dumb in my opinion, in the first place, that they limited the provinces. Even though you can still get territories, it's like, eh. Um, all subjects now get reduced to aggressive expansion from your actions, not just vassals and marches. This makes sense, and mainly talks about personal union uh, members, uh, but also, you know, colonies. Um, embracing an institution no longer adds it to every province. Um, I'm assuming institutions give a bonus of some kind. Um, and so... You know, not adding it to every province means that um, not every province is going to get a massive bonus um, for having the institution, so that makes sense. Uh, royal marriages now have a 50% chance of getting a queen, and a newborn heir is a 100% chance of getting a local noble as a queen. So, yeah, um, I guess what this is saying is if you have a royal marriage um, with somebody else and is of their dynasty, then there's a 50% chance of getting a queen, I guess. Or, or whenever an heir is born to a certain marriage. Um, and a newborn heir is a 100% chance of getting a local noble as a queen. Um, I, I think that means if there is a queen, then... I'm, I'm actually not sure what that's saying. Um, but yeah, it's... It, it seems to be trying to improve the chances of actually getting a queen, uh, which happened a lot in, like, history, so I'm, I'm all for that. It makes a lot of sense to me, but, um, anyway. Colonization missions should now not trigger for Catholics for regions already granted to someone else by the Pope. Um, yeah, so, so basically when you, uh, have the Treaty of Tordesillas, I believe, um, then you can't get the mission to, like, colonize there. Um, yeah, because it's granted by the Pope. So that's basically what that's saying. Um, colonists that are working in occupied provinces will now get sent home. That makes sense. Um, let's see. The Privy Council Establishment Act and the Mercenary Registration Act now use mill power instead of admin power. I think those are policies that... Um, I'm not sure what the Privy Council Establishment Act does, but the Mercenary Registration Act, I think... Um, either increases the number of available mercenaries or lowers their costs. So that makes sense that it uses military instead of admin power. Um, although although I, I could see the mercenary registration making sense for admin because so many admin ideas lower mercenary costs. But uh, anyway, uh, changed a few policies to reduce corruption or increase institution spread. Um, that's pretty nice, actually, because uh, having ways to reduce corruption is always good. Um, and increasing institution spread is pretty good from what we understand about the new tech system. Uh, boosted the following policies. Um, I would love to actually pull up and uh, look at these policies, but that would take a while and I don't want to waste your time any more than has already gone on in this video, uh, which is nearing 30 minutes. Um, and uh, But yeah, it seems like there's some pretty good um, things going on here. Uh, Muslims that have converted to another religion group will now lose Ikta and or the Ottoman government. Um, that makes sense. Like, obviously, it's hard to be an Ikta if you're not Muslim. I mean, that makes sense to me, I guess. Um, the Ottoman mission for conquering the Levant now includes inland Syrian provinces. I guess this makes sense. Uh, before, it was all coastal stuff, so it made things difficult. Um, I, I think I'm going to save the AI changes for another video, because this video has already gone on for long enough, and I don't want to have it drag on too much, and I want people to be able to go to whatever they want to go to, so... 
Um, that being said, what I do know about the AI is that uh, re- leader personalities now actually affect how the AI plays, which is really cool from what I've heard of people talking about it. So, uh, anyway, thank you for joining me, my fellow conquerors, and uh, I will see you guys on the next one.